Chucky. And I'm your friend to the end. Heidi fucking ho. Ha, ha, ha. And welcome back to Chucky Queers. It's our weekly coverage of Don Mancini's series, Season 2. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're discussing Season 2, Episode 7, the penultimate episode, Go Into the Chapel. <laughs> Wait, are you sure it's not the finale? Because I fucking thought you and I were joking right before we hit record. Are we sure that there are more episodes? Because this feels like a finale. Yeah, listen, so I'm watching this today. I was like, well, last season was eight episodes, but I guess I didn't see sci-fi confirm an episode <laughs> count for season two. So maybe this is the finale. It's not, luckily. It's not. But, um. <laughs> Yeah, we are we are really wrapping up um, everything except for two things, maybe <laughs> this mm-hmm. episode. <laughs> well, it's hilarious because I was reflecting back on our discussion last week because I was editing the episode, and we literally said that exact same thing. Last week's episode felt like it hit the accelerator, and we wondered, well, where are we going to go for two more episodes? And now I have even bigger questions about where can this finale possibly go because it feels like we have our result nearly everything man i'm I'm really thinking next week's gonna be a big old setup for whatever season three is gonna be i mean cool i guess i guess i i'm honestly just a little bit stunned because i was not ready for this like to backtrack you and i as we said numerous times have been watching screeners so there's like a one sentence description about what we can expect with the episode sometimes we're getting previously ons we're never getting like what's to come next week Mm -hmm. but you and i had inadvertently looked at what was in this episode and you mentioned oh i guess father bryce is getting exercised so we thought last week we were going to see something and it just kind of never showed up so i thought oh okay well i guess something's gonna happen in episode seven to father bryce (laughs) didn't expect him to get fucking exploded five times over in slow mo trace this looked fantastic and again god it's so good it's so awesome it doesn't really make a lot of sense i don't understand how chucky makes him explode but um I, I, okay, I guess I hear so pulling pulling back Joe so are you a fan of this like it, or or is it wrapping up all these things that you were had concerns about earlier this season is it wrapping them up too quickly for you to be honest no if only because it's doing it so quickly that I can barely catch my breath and it feels like a thrill ride I'm wondering I mean again like hypothetically if you went back and watch rewatch this season mm-hmm. if the things that were bugging you earlier in the season won't bother you as much because they're not, I guess, as big of a deal <laughs> in, in the grand scheme of things compared to what, everything else. Because, yeah, we we uh, we get rid of a lot. Of, like, Sister Ruth, honestly, is my biggest weakness for this season. I think so, too. It's a little disappointing because we talked about how much we like that actress. And it mm-hmm. felt like they were building up to something a little bit grander. And so, well, I think her death here is quite satisfying. It also felt a little underwhelming considering, oh, well, we had this actress. You really couldn't have used her a little bit better. Yeah, it's like, okay. Like, you know how in American Horror Story Asylum, everyone's like, oh, it's the best season, but oh my god, that that alien, if they would just remove the Mm -hmm. aliens up on it's one thing too many. That's kind of how I feel about Sister Ruth, in the sense that, hey, yeah, I wish this actress had more to work with, and she really felt like she was off on her own this entire time. Like A little bit, yeah. But uh, that's honestly my only big gripe, because I really enjoyed everything else happening, and Mm -hmm. my prediction from the very first episode of the season came true, because it is definitely (laughs) Chucky and Dr. Mixture. (laughs) Yeah, as soon as we saw that closing moment, I thought, oh, wow, Trace really did call this from the very beginning. (laughs) I just, we've never seen Charles Lee Ray and or Chucky be able to keep their cool for so long. So I figured, oh, no, she must just be a kind of nefarious human villain because typically Chucky will show his hand because he just can't contain his glee. Well, but I'm confused, though, because Chucky Prime Mm -hmm. is not Dr. Mixer. Well, unless uh, unless <laughs> the Chucky Prime is really in Dr. Mixer and Dr. Mixer was talking a big fucking game. Well, but OK, OK, maybe this will all get explained next week. So this is a moot conversation. But like mm-hmm. that means, though, then the, the Chucky that possessed Nika in Cult of Chucky was not Chucky Prime. Correct. Okay. Yes. I guess that's really, that's it. That's the only explanation I need. <laughs> I mean, this could be a very long con. This series has a very good history in terms of like, we remember what happened in other movies and then we bring it back 
10 years later, seven years later, five years later. So I wouldn't be surprised if we get some kind of interesting retcon or double explanation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I, actually wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised about the retcon either, because we I mean, we saw that last year when it was, oh, Tiffany called Chris Sarandon on Charles Lee Ray, which set the events of the first film into motion. So I wouldn't be surprised if we got something like that here, especially knowing that Dr. Mixture was his therapist as a kid. So yes. he could theoretically have been inside of her for years for yet yeah, for decades since before the first movie even started so mm -hmm. yeah i'm um yeah okay well hey, so um <laughs> uh, i'm like where do i want to start um we have a lot of these black and white confession see, uh scenes where mm -hmm. you know one part of their clothing or hair is in color love it very stylish very memorable it made me appreciate some of don's comments when we had him on the podcast and he was like yeah you know when i was doing stuff on hannibal and i was like oh you know what i can see a lot of just little things that he maybe took that he thought they either look good or he could do something in his own flavor with them. Yeah, I mean, we do get a quid pro quo scene essentially in here with a mm -hmm. the Hannibal Lecter mask. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I liked all these fine. I mean, at first I was kind of like, okay, like we're, this is just kind of like the gimmick we're doing for this episode. But we get mm -hmm. the reveal that Father Bryce is gay. I think so. I mean, I think that this is one of those instances where as queer viewers, we immediately perk up because to us, it feels like recognition because we're so used to having to read the subtext to look for the coding. So I immediately was like, yes, confirmation, there it is. But I could really easily also see non queer viewers just being like, oh, he's just got a, a secret. It's not really elaborated on like it's, it's so open ended that I think people could read what they want into this. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that as well. And you know, we'll stick with the queer aspect then, because yeah, we do kind of get not a resolution of choice, but we, we at least have people calling out Jake and Devin for being like, do y'all have anything in common besides this fucking doll? <laughs> and it's good because there's has been this kind of uh, arc throughout the season where we wanted to see them happy. But of course, instead, we treat them like a traditional couple. And as soon as they get together, they start to have problems and that's nothing but conflict. So it is nice to see them actually acknowledge it and not just have Lexi be like I'm really rooting for you guys because everything else in my life is horrible yeah which I mean thank god Lexi's you know, pill popping comes back and then mm -hmm. but only so she can have a ghostly vision hallucination of Nadine which mm -hmm. this is fine it was kind of I was kind of like oh like it was a little cheesy for me but it, it's fine because now we're finally out of this goddamn pill thing <laughs> I hope <laughs> Maybe. I mean, the reality is, of course, addiction is not that easily conquered. But yeah, I thought it was a nice resolution to that storyline, I'm assuming. And it was nice to see Nadine again, you know, in a, a reassuring, calm, sparkly presence. I like the costume. It was fun. Oh, yeah. yeah, it it felt a little... I don't want to say middle grader, but it definitely <laughs> felt like a softer way to bring this character back and give her a nice send off. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised we did it so soon after her death, but um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I, I, I like you, I like this actress, so it's I have no problem with this. I was just kind of like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing, show. Um, right. But yeah, but I mean, honestly, the big set piece is we have an exorcism here that pretty much brings mm -hmm. every major character into the same room. Sans Tiffany and Glenn and Jennifer Tilly. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I was living for all this. Um, I love the, the the Kyle and Andy reunion. I loved mm -hmm. everyone like comparing their traumas together. Yeah, this is this was as a fan of this franchise who has loved this franchise for decades. Like this was a very cathartic episode for me. Just watching all these people just exist in the same room together mm -hmm. and their interactions felt very honest and true to who the characters have become like they were actually addressing the things that we would want them to address considering that they haven't yes. seen each other in some time and that felt mm -hmm. really gratifying yeah no I, I hard agree on that yeah it just it, it felt i think again looking back comparing this season to the first one i felt that we've been kind of pulled back a lot looking at like the big picture whereas the first mm -hmm. season i think had more kind of heartfelt personable moments right mostly in that first half of the season before we start introduce the legacy characters so i'm not even mm -hmm. like saying this is a critique it's more of an observation of this season compared to the first season yeah but having these little moments of these characters interacting and like you know being like dude doesn't our, don't our life suck <laughs> yeah. it, it was a very nice like moment of humanity that i don't feel like we've had a lot of this season 
So I'm curious, let's spend a beat with the twins because they're kind of the big addition this season. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've been playing catch up and moving the various other characters around the chessboard, setting up this final confrontation. What do you think of the way that the twins storyline has been handled? Are you happy with where it seems to be going? Because I feel like we're definitely setting up a ooh, Glenda is definitely still a killer and they take after their father. Um, I actually really enjoyed uh, the Glenda stuff this season. And okay. I, I was actually going to say that I'm happy that it's not the seed of Chucky where it's like, oh, is he a killer? Is he not a killer? Is he a killer? Is he not a killer? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what's going on? Right. It's, it's It feels more like a, hey, like th th they have some issues that they're dealing with and yeah, they have murderous tendencies, but it, mm -hmm. it's not this will they, won't they type thing. Oh, interesting. I feel like there's going to be a bunch of people who maybe disagree with that sentiment because this episode felt like it was confirming, oh, no, that will they won't they doesn't exist. They always have had murder tendencies. But mm -hmm. I think up until this point, it did feel like a, ooh, maybe like we're not actually sure how much of this was the twins and how much was just the influence of their murderous parents. Yeah, but I mean, like, you know, we, we know that Glinda killed Jeeves the butler in episode four. It's like, we, we know that they have the the ability to kill when it's right. necessary, but we don't know if they want to just kill for the fun of it. And we still <laughs> don't really know that. Nevertheless, I'm more intrigued to have this journey because I feel like we're going to, it's it's not going to, I'm hoping, it's not going to be a cheap plot gimmick where it's just mm -hmm. going to be like, no, we're going to actually like investigate these twins and how, how their right. lives led to this and like to have these conversations, which I think might be more of the focus of season three. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to ask you next is, do you think that these characters will continue to be an active part of the series? Oh, and yeah. It feels like a very obvious yes, of course. Otherwise, why would we have introduced them and given this plum role to Lachlan Watson and really given them the star treatment this season? But this does feel like, yeah, we're setting up for a larger story where the twins are going to have to examine their relationship. And particularly if Glenda becomes a killer in their own right. And what does that mean for Glenn? I mean... I don't think Glenn is going to die just because they've been shot. That would be very disappointing. And I think that Don realizes that these two characters are too important to just get rid of easily. <laughs> Unless they were like, we cannot keep putting this horrible wig on Lachlan Watson's head. <laughs> so let's just kill Glenn. <laughs> I will say the the wig is not convincing. And partially, I just think Lachlan Watson looks so fucking good with the short hair that part of me is like, you know, I had the opportunity to talk to the costume designer about the way that she styled everybody, particularly Jennifer Tilly and the twins. And it was interesting to get that kind of confirmation that we were really looking for rock star sensibilities with Glenda. I'm like, oh, OK, yes, yeah. good. I, I was on the right track with my reading. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So so we have lost Father Bryce. We have lost Sister Ruth and Joe. We have, I think lost jennifer tilly right in that semi explosion <laughs> two bride of chucky homages first we have mm -hmm. the, the 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 hostage trade-off of, right. of the climax but then yeah this 18 wheeler <laughs> explosion i god damn it i am really hoping she transfer her doll into that glenn glenn glenda doll because i don't want mm. to lose jennifer tilly as a character because i think it is so funny to have her on the show and i like seeing jennifer tilly play something different than kind of our dumb aloof tiffany character yeah, that was one of the bigger surprises in this episode. And I thought it was kind of delightful when the doll exploded because that was, I thought, the only explosion we were going to get in this episode. <laughs> and it's very well done. Yeah, I love the Bride of Chucky homage. But I'm in agreement with you. I, I really like the idea of Tilly getting to play multiple parts in the same way that Brad Dourif has been getting to do different vocal performances. And I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're just going to stick with Jennifer Tilly as a human being who is playing Tiffany moving mm -hmm. forward. But you never know. I mean, <laughs> we have been proven wrong so many times on this series in the way that they bring characters back. You never know. It's a soap opera level where it's like, yeah, it like is. no one is ever really dead. And of course, I'm sure yeah. we're going to get Devin Sawa back in the next in the next season as some sure. other character. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I did really. I, I know I've lobbied a lot of critiques against this episode in season as a whole this 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 week but i really enjoyed this and mm -hmm. it's, i'm just still having a lot of fun with it and I, i'm excited to for next week because i just don't know what's gonna happen 
Yeah, no, it feels like the slate has been wiped completely clean apart from Dr. Mixter. Where we go next is anyone's game. Well, because she says, she's like, I want to unleash a bunch of Chuckies on the world again. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, like, we're going to have to have a flashback next week, which actually benefited this season over last season. We haven't had all those flashbacks. No flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> I kept waiting for it. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we get a little bit of how did Dr. Mixer get mixed up in all of this Chucky drama when Charles Lee Ray was a boy. Because I do think that that might help to explain some of the characters' motivations. She's still super vague. I have no idea why she's doing what she's doing. Is she just a psychopath who wants to unleash hell? If so, that's a little bit dull. I hope there's a bit more to it. Yeah, but yeah, you you want to you don't want just like a a villain is villain because they're villain. Um. I feel like that's more of who Chucky is. So we've already done that. Mm. We've already done it with Tilly. even Well, Tiffany, Illy. But she is Chucky. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Also, I feel like it's going to be a bit redundant if we just do a Unleash Dolls on the World again. Because that was the plot of season one. Yeah. And technically what Cult of Chucky was leading up to. Hmm. So we'll see. I mean, I'm definitely intrigued. This season, I feel, has veered in a lot of different directions than I expected, like way more so than season one. But every week is a delight, so (laughs) I'm on board for the finale. Just going to tell you, my last bullet point in my page and a half of notes for this episode, I knew this bitch was Chucky, LOL. (laughs) (laughs) Confirmation. (laughs) Um, But yeah, okay, well, um, yeah, I don't really have any predictions for next week other than, I mean, I hope we still keep the gang together. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. And I hope that, I mean, because this really did seem like a farewell to Andy and Kyle because we get that nice, at least in our version, um, we kind of do a repeat of the ending of Child's Play 2 with the same dialogue. Um, Yes. I'm going to be interested to see if they change that for the final release. So that was just a placeholder for us. But Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really touching. But to the point where it really does feel like that's the end of these characters on this show. Yes. Like, thank you for coming back. We've given the happy send off to these characters. Maybe they're going to go off and have productive lives. Goodbye. Yeah. I don't know. So I don't know what to predict, Joe, but I I, I am very much looking forward to not knowing what's happening next week. Yeah, it's just going to be a big old surprise, (laughs) which is perfect because it feels very on brand for this show. Yep. Well, everyone, uh, okay, I guess, um, yeah, let us know your thoughts of this episode and where do you think we're going next week? But until next week's finale, we can cross out going to the chapel. Indeed. And cross out Chucky Queers. A long stretch of road that encompasses everything the city of Kennet Heights has to offer. Neon lights, traffic, crime, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and the craziest of characters. My office was above it all. My name is James Locke, and I'm a P.I. Hello, Mr. J. How the hell you doing today? Good, Edith. Nearly every year I have a new case. New people to meet, new clues to discover, and new problems to solve. But I do it the old-fashioned way. No technology. Nothing post-1950. Hell, I don't even listen to podcasts, but you should. Atlas Avenue Beat is a spoof of the film noir genre with goofy characters, tons of wordplay, and non-stop raunchy humor. There's also three whole seasons out right now with more on the way. Just search for Atlas Avenue Beat wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at bloody.fm. Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep, a podcast where I tell you spooky bedtime stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror. This is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality. Speaking of escapes, sometimes I lead you through guided nightmares like a guided meditation, but instead of flowery meadows, I take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare. So come get lost in the terror with me. Listen to Scare You to Sleep wherever you listen to podcasts or find us online at bloody.fm. Sweet screams.